I begin with a very touching image of a little girl watching her policeman father having his lunch outside the house so that he doesn't spread the coronavirus to his family. Please stay safe and ensure your dear ones are safe. Please like, subscribe and share the channel to motivate us. US and China relationships continue to touch new lows. On 4th March 2020, A Chinese foreign ministry spokesperson, Li Jian Zhao, pushed an unproven claim on the social media, which he again followed up on Twitter on 12th of March 2020, in which he claimed, "It might be the US army who brought the epidemic to Wuhan. Be transparent. Make your data public." The allegations were linked to the military world games held in Wuhan last year. The event drew competitors from more than 100 countries that included US soldiers. Zhao later shared articles from a Canadian-based conspiracy website. The US embassy in Beijing didn't respond immediately. Zhao's tweets came after US Secretary of State Mike Pompeo used the term Wuhan virus. Some politicians of the US also use the term Chinese coronavirus. Beijing has been resisting the idea that virus originated in China. Even though the first cases were reported from China. A single word scrawled in black marker stood out among the prepared remarks of President Donald Trump, which was part of his press briefing on 19th of March 2020. for the ongoing coronavirus pandemic in the president's notes corona had been crossed out and replaced with the word chinese again on 23rd march 2020 trump defense calling the coronavirus as a chinese virus i would like to virus. begin by announcing some important developments in our war against the chinese virus you keep calling this the chinese why do you keep using this a lot it of comes from china racist. It's not racist at all. No, not at all. It comes from China. That's why. It comes from China. I want to be accurate. Geng Shuang, a spokesperson for the Chinese Foreign Ministry, said, "Calling the virus Chinese virus amounted to stigmatization of China." He says, "We urge the US to correct its mistake and stop its groundless accusations against China." Matters got worse when on 26th March 2020, The president signed the Taiwan Allies International Protection and Enhancement Initiative Act or the Taipei Act 2019 indicating US support for Taiwan internationally which is likely to infuriate a China already angry with Trump's Chinese virus terminology as of now the Chinese coercion politics has severely restricted the number of countries that maintain formal ties with Taipei to 15 and has prevented it from participating in bodies like the world health organization so much so that the who officials balk on being asked about taiwan a senior who official has raised hackles in taiwan by appearing to dodge questions about taiwan's exclusion from the world health consider taiwan's membership hello We, with the, with the, I'm sorry, I can't hear. You. I couldn't hear your question. Okay, yeah. Let me let, let me let me repeat the question. No, that's so. okay. Let, let's move to another one then. When Eilwood was asked about Taiwan, he stalled for close to ten seconds and avoided a reporter's question, but the reporter persisted. I'm actually curious on talking about Taiwan as well on Taiwan's case. We decided to give Dr. Alward another call to follow up. And I just want to see if you can comment a bit on how Taiwan has done so far in terms of containing the virus. Well, we've we've already talked about China. Alward is an assistant director general at the WHO and is a Canadian trained epidemiologist. The Taipei Act calls for US to reduce its economic, security, and diplomatic engagements with nations that take serious or significant actions to undermine Taiwan. It also calls on the US to help Taiwan gain participation in international organizations either as a member or as an observer. The China-Taiwan fight goes back to 
when during the Chinese Civil War, Mao's Chinese Communists defeated the Chiang Kai-shek-led ruling Kuomintang government or the KMT and forced them to flee to Taiwan, an island off the coast of Chinese mainland. The communist-governed China came to be known as the People's Republic of China, while the KMT-led Taiwan became the Republic of China with both claiming legitimacy of representing the Chinese mainland. Since then, China has always considered Taiwan as one of its provinces and Taiwan has been asserting its independence. At that time, Taiwan was a member of the United Nations Security Council and enjoyed US support during the Cold War. During the 1970s, US realized that Taiwan was a market of only 18 million people as compared to China, which had 600 million people and was by far the biggest market in the world. And so it shifted its allegiance, which resulted in the United Nations giving the Security Council seat to China from Taiwan on 15th November 1971. Over the years, a belligerently growing China asserted its One China policy, which meant that there was only one China and any country could either maintain relations with China or with Taiwan, which ensured international isolation of Taiwan. As of date, there are only 15 countries which have formal diplomatic relations with Taiwan. With the Taipei Act 2019, the US has put its weight behind Taiwan, which has put the cat amongst the pigeons. It would be interesting to watch the international reaction to these few questions. Number 1. Considering the stakes that the US has in China, how far is it ready to go? Number 2. Would the international community toe the US line or would it still be in awe of the dragon? How high would the Chinese lift the stakes to checkmate the US and Taiwan to enforce a status quo? And finally, what would be India's position? While Taiwan is happy at the US support, which is seen as a major development in its path towards international recognition, but it won't forget the unceremonious way the US conspired with the People's Republic of China in 1971 to throw it out of the United Nations. The world which sided with the People's Republic of China in 1971 is still guided by the same capitalist ambitions. And the might of the present-day China has increased many efforts from what it was in 1971. As for projections made by PricewaterCooper, China would be world's leading economy by 2050, which would definitely make the Committee of Nations trade very, very carefully. As for India, the options are not very many. Considering the rapid strides that China is taking in asserting itself in the region, the territorial disputes and the Chinese hegemony in settling them its way, and not to mention the ever worrisome Pakistan-China nexus, it would serve India well to foresee the inevitable clash on its eastern borders and take a long-term strategic view. Taiwan definitely opens a lot of options. With this, we come to the end of this episode. Jai Hind!